Cade Milfolcha. Yes, historians, 100,000 welcomes to Ireland. If you look up the term British Isles, you'll find that Great Britain and Ireland are the two largest members of the island group. So, you may assume that they're relatively homogenous in terms of culture and history. After all, the islands are just 12 miles apart at the Irish Sea's narrowest point. By now, you also may be thinking, gee, we've talked a lot about England, the most significant portion of Great Britain, in this course, but we've barely mentioned its neighbor, so aptly dubbed the Emerald Isle. Yes, England has a bit of an outsized presence in any study of the last thousand years, particularly between 1750 and 1950. And England has controlled Ireland for much of the last millennium. However, despite this fact, the two places are strikingly different. Previously, we explored how former British colonies were able to achieve independence. Today, Let's move to England's closest neighbor and see how Ireland struggled to win home rule. Our guiding questions are, what was the relationship between England and Ireland between the 12th and 17th centuries? How did the hard times experienced during the Great Famine contribute to the home rule movement? How did Ireland finally gain autonomy? Our big picture question is, how do past conflicts influence current perspectives? Janie Gijeffer, let's hurry up and get to learning about Irish home rule. England's control over Ireland dates back to when the English Anglo-Norman ruling class invaded in the 1100s. In the following centuries, English settlers would come to Ireland, settle, and typically integrate into Irish society. During the 16th century, England tightened its control over the Emerald Isle. They subordinated Ireland as a client state. It had its own government, but that government was controlled by England. The British government created enclaves for English and Scottish settlers in Ulster, the northern part of the island. The 12-mile journey across the Irish Sea was relatively short for these newcomers, but the difference between their cultures was, and is, vast. These new English settlers spoke English rather than Irish, also known as Gaelic. They were more urban and affluent than most of Ireland's rural population of modest means. And perhaps more importantly, most English were Protestant, while most Irish were Catholic. As you may know, during the medieval era, Catholicism was more than just a religion, it was a way of life. The Irish were particularly devoted to their faith. To this day, Catholicism remains a significant part of Irish culture and identity. Over time, England gained control over more of the island. There was a tendency among the English to look down on the Irish, and they typically did not intermarry. English Protestants were allowed to take the land of Irish Catholics for themselves. When the Irish rebelled against the British invasion, English military officer Oliver Cromwell, remember him? brutally subjugated the Irish, an act labeled by some historians as genocide. Cromwell's conquest resulted in nearly half the Irish population being killed or conscripted into forced labor on English colonies in the Caribbean. Following Cromwell's conquest, England tried to force Protestantism and the English language on the people of Ireland, which served to harden local resentment of English rule and of the settlers who had arrived from across the Irish Sea. Catholics, the majority of the population, were excluded from government and land ownership, furthering resentment. Most English landowners remained in England, managing and profiting off Irish land without being bothered to even go there. Ireland was, more or less, a colony of England. Let's consider our first guiding question. What was the relationship between England and Ireland between the 12th to the 17th centuries? In 
In 1801, Britain formally made Ireland part of the United Kingdom and removed its parliament. While it was a setback for Irish nationalists, Ireland did gain representation in the British Parliament. The political leader of Ireland's Catholic majority was Daniel O'Connell, who, like Simon Bolivar, was nicknamed the Liberator. He was twice elected to Parliament, and through his efforts, many Catholic rights were restored in Ireland. But do you remember how Ireland was basically used as an English colony? To sum it up, the Irish people worked on English-owned farms in Ireland to raise animals and grow crops that would be sent off to England, leaving very little land and resources to grow food that would feed the Irish people. So they turned to the hardy potato, which was packed with nutritional value and didn't require much space to grow. And then, in the 1840s, an uninvited microscopic visitor arrived, Phytophthora infestans. In other words, a parasite that would go on to destroy the one thing that kept the Irish people nourished. The potato crop was decimated, resulting in what's known as the Great Famine, which caused the death of nearly one-eighth of the Irish population and the emigration of another one-eighth. Meanwhile, the English landlords still demanded payment of rent by the tenant farmers and, even during the years of famine, continued to export their own healthy crops and meat back to England. Many Irish lost their homes and fell into debt, while English landowners profited from higher food prices, the result of smaller supplies creating increased demand. After this period of Androhi, or the hard times, Irish people had enough. They had been pushed around by their neighbors to the east for far too long. The Home Rule Movement emerged in 1870, which called for domestic control of affairs within Ireland while maintaining the bond of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland. How did the hard times experienced during the Great Famine contribute to the Home Rule Movement? Britain resisted for a while, but eventually the cries for Home Rule became too strong. In 1914, the British Parliament enacted a Home Rule Bill for Southern Ireland that excluded the majority Protestant areas. And just as it was about to take effect, well, guess what happened? Yep, the largest war in mankind's history up to that point, World War I, an Irish Home Rule ground to a screeching halt. After the initial shock wore off, Irish nationalists got back to work. In the 1916 Easter Rising, pro-nationalist riots broke out in Dublin. When the British army violently suppressed the rebellion and executed its leaders, it only served to galvanize nationalists against British rule. In 1917, the Irish Republican Army, or IRA, formed, and in 1919, they declared independence for Ireland, which sparked the Irish War for Independence. Over the next two and a half years, outbreaks of guerrilla warfare dotted the land. The end result was the establishment of two Irelands in 1922, the Irish Free State and Northern Ireland, which remained part of the United Kingdom. So, how did Ireland finally gain autonomy? A free Ireland did not signal an end to the problems, however, as militant organizations in Northern Ireland, split by the nationalist, mostly Catholic, and loyalist, mostly Protestant divide, carried on decades of terrorism, only ceasing in 1998 with the Good Friday Agreement. Scars from this period, called the Troubles, still exist. As of the early 2020s, walls remain between Catholic and Protestant neighborhoods in Belfast, Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland is still part of the United Kingdom, while Ireland is a sovereign state, part of the European Union. Ireland and the United Kingdom engage in peaceful diplomatic relations and are mutual trading partners. As we wrap up here, think about how centuries of animosity may contribute to the way people view each other, especially in Northern Ireland. In your PDF, you'll be answering this question. How do past conflicts influence current perspectives? Now, sit back and enjoy a warm fire in a traditional Irish pub while eating some shepherd's pie and listening to folk musicians. We'll be departing the Emerald Isle soon and heading to another former British colony, uh, 
Are we noticing a trend here? Yep, the good old US of A. Slan, and see you there, because history is everywhere. Hey.